Welcome to the sixth talk in this series looking at the links between Titanic and the city of Dundee in Scotland. Despite the fact that no passengers or crew from Titanic were from Dundee, there was a lot of fundraising locally, as there was all around the United Kingdom. Southampton had the largest amount of fundraising as 79% of the deceased crew came from there. Other significant ports in Titanic's short history, namely Belfast where she was built, and Liverpool, where she was registered, also weighed in heavily with financial assistance for families of the deceased. This was especially important in the days before universal social benefits were available, and the death of the household's breadwinner could leave the family in crippling poverty more often than not. It is also relevant that the employees of the White Star Line aboard Titanic that night had their contract of employment terminated at the precise time the ship went down in the North Atlantic. The largest of these charitable funds was the London-based Mansion House Relief or Lord Mayor's Fund to which a lot of individuals and organisations contributed. The eventual total collected by this fund was for £112,000 which is the 1912 equivalent of about £45 million in today's currency. In the Dundee Courier on Monday 29th of April 1912, the managing director of Her Majesty's Theatre Seagate Dundee informed the newspaper's readers that after its entertainment programme on Sunday the 5th of May there would be a Titanic Disaster Fund concert. It is likely that the monies collected at this concert in Her Majesty's Theatre Seagate, the interior of which is shown here, will be added to the Lord Mayor's Fund in accordance with this notice in the Courier on Friday the 26th of April 1912. Lord Provost Urquhart Dundee has decided to forward all subscriptions given on behalf of sufferers to the Lord Mayor's Mansion House Relief Fund. On Wednesday the 24th of April this picture appeared in the Courier. It introduced Pedro, a novel charity collector in Dundee. A follow-up on Saturday the 27th of April informed the readership that Pedro collected £9, 3 shillings and 4 pence to aid Titanic sufferers. On Monday the 9th of April, the Courier updated the figure to £14 and 4 shillings for the week. It may seem strange for a dog to be used to collect for a non-dog related or animal related charity fund. However, this was not confined to Dundee nor to the Titanic Fund. The first reference to a charity collecting dog was on a postcard from the early 20th century. To take advantage of the British love of animals, a dog called Joe was fitted out with a box strapped to his back into which donations could be dropped. He was trained in September 1910, at the end of which he was presented with a beautiful silver collar by the Earl of Malmesbury. As the family seat had always been within Hampshire, it is reasonable to assume that Joe was trained in that county, which is also the county in which Southampton is located. Sales of the postcard were devoted to the fund for the Prince of Wales Hospital in Tottenham. On the postcard it read that Joe has collected for Help the Children Fund and the Convalescence Homes and also the Titanic Disaster Fund. Possessed as he is of a wonderful docility, children of tender years can approach him without the slightest fear of resentment. The Empire Theatre in Southampton stationed two dogs with collecting receptacles outside the theatre beside the poster announcing a benefit screening for Titanic's victims' families. Collections for the Titanic Relief Fund came from all quarters, as shown by this notice for a cricket match in the Dundee Courier on Wednesday 22nd of May 1912. The bravery of Titanic's band in playing throughout the entire sinking episode, and so sacrificing their own lives in order to keep up the spirits of the passengers during the crisis, has been widely publicised. A daily insertion in the Dundee Courier from Tuesday the 30th of April until Saturday the 4th of May 1912 gave notice of two concerts. One, a grand military concert in Dutta Park at 3 o'clock on Sunday the 5th of May. And the second, a grand orchestral and vocal concert at the King's Theatre at 6.30pm on Sunday the 5th of May. A silver collection was taken at both concerts in aid of the widows and children of musicians drowned in the Titanic disaster. Further details of the King's Theatre concert were given on page 7 of the Courier on the 4th of May. It informed the readers that there would be a choir of 50 voices with full orchestral accompaniments, while the soloists will be Mrs. Frederick Gibson and Mr. T. Bissett, a quartet party consisting of Miss M. Aiken, Miss Peggy Wallace, Mr. Bissett and Mr. A. Arnold will also appear.
It mentioned the silver collection again and added that in view of the heroism which the bandsmen displayed at the last moments, the citizens, it is hoped, will be very bountiful in their patronage. On Monday the 17th of June, the following report appeared in the Dundee Courier. In Brecon Bandstand in the public park yesterday, a successful concert was given, the proceeds going towards the band fund in aid of the musicians drowned by the sinking of the Titanic. This was a nationwide phenomenon. The entertainment industry was very active in raising funds for their colleagues as they saw it. The eight musicians were not employed by the White Star Line, but were booked through CW and FN Black in Liverpool, who were the agents for the majority of musicians sailing on British registered ships. They boarded at Southampton and travelled as second-class passengers. Until the night of the sinking, when all eight band members played together, the musicians played as a three-piece and five-piece ensemble. None of them survived the sinking. The need for these collections for the families of the deceased musicians is highlighted by an incident recounted in the book and the band played on, written by Christopher Ward, who was the grandson of Jock Hume, a violinist on the Titanic. On the morning of the 30th of April, just two weeks after the tragedy, and still waiting for definite news of Jock's fate, a letter arrived at the house of Andrew Hume, Jock's father, postmarked Liverpool. Christopher Ward takes up the story. Andrew snatched the envelope from Alice, Jock's mother, and tore it open. The letter was not, as he had hoped, from the White Star Line. It was from C.W. and F.N. Black, and it said, Dear Sir, we should be obliged if you remit us the sum of five shillings and fourpence, which is owing to us as per enclosed statement. We should also be obliged if you will settle the enclosed uniform account. Yours faithfully, C.W. and F.N. Black. And read the letter and the accompanying statement three times with growing disbelief. At first he thought it must be a clerical error, or possibly a practical joke in the worst possible taste. Without saying anything, Andrew passed the letter to Alice, who read it, and immediately burst into tears. The statement explained that Jock, pictured here, was to have been paid four pounds for the return voyage on the Titanic, but as the ship had sunk before even reaching New York, Blacks had terminated his contract from 2.20am on the 15th of April, the moment the band could no longer play on. Jock's wages, reduced pro rata, were now insufficient to meet the expenses that Blacks had incurred on his behalf through the outfitter's rainers. These included the provision of White Star lapel insignias for the bandsman's tunic, sewing White Star buttons on his uniform, one shilling, and Jock's sheet music, which was now floating somewhere in the North Atlantic. The total Andrew was been asked to pay came to 14 shillings and sevenpence, less than a pound, but a sum with approximately £40 of buying power in today's currency. There was no accompanying letter of regret, no word of sympathy. The contrast between the business-as-usual attitude of some commercial enterprises to the disaster and the overwhelming generosity of the man in the street is no better highlighted than the above story. The memorial to these musicians who made the ultimate sacrifice by doing their job until the end can be seen at the corner of Cumberland Place and London Road in Southampton. The fundraising efforts mentioned above, as a sample of those from Dundee, again indicate the effect the disaster had on the population of the UK, when Dundee, with no direct connection with Titanic, went to such efforts to support the families of the victims. More details of the subjects dealt with in this talk can be found in the book Dundee Man Lost at Sea, available from Amazon and Kindle. The next talk in the series will be available soon. Thank you.